Right, so picking up from this one, we got to this aircraft. Now, what we were talking about in the previous slide was how they were doing cantilever wings with some sort of supports, but it was also common to use that old box type shape that was derived from the, uh, the, the kite form, the way in which the Wright brothers had thought that this was how you got the lift because of wing area. Um, what these planes were trying to do is they were trying to solve a couple of problems. Now, we mentioned at the end of the last class that the funny part of the process was that at the start of the war, when they started to use aircraft for other than reconnaissance, when they started to actually use them as an offensive weapon, so they might have, as you mentioned a moment ago, Jordan, that they might have been throwing star pickets or something out of the... Oh, no, it was Alex here, yeah, throwing them out. And they eventually worked out that you could drop bombs from the, the planes as well. And so they'd just go and do the mission of reconnaissance and then do some damage on the way home, or maybe on the way out, whatever. Um, shooting down observation balloons. Um, an interesting thing about observation balloons at this time, too, was an invention that Leonardo da Vinci had suggested was possible but hadn't quite got the, the nuances at all because the materials of the times weren't, weren't quite right. And that was the idea of a parachute. Um, the French would develop it a little bit better and by the time you get to World War, II, World War I, um, the idea of going up in a balloon and having someone shoot the balloon out from underneath you didn't get many volunteers. So I said, I don't want to do that job, thank you very much. But if you went up with an option that you could jump out um, and that you might survive the fall because the parachute would save you. So parachutes weren't at first used by any of the aviators other than the balloonists or the people who were doing the observation balloon work. Um, later on, of course, it'd become a valuable tool. Uh, we might talk a little bit more about parachutes when we get to World War II. Um, so you've got this principle now where there's an offensive weapon and you send other guys up to shoot down your offensive weapons and so now you've got this knights of the air concept starting this gallantry in, in the air and a lot of the guys that flew planes in world war one tended to be from the more um, let's say um, in particularly in germany from the upper classes and that's because you were supposedly going to have to have a fair bit of intelligence to be a flight a pilot but really what the skill was, and I'll talk about the skills in a second, the skill set you needed to be a really good pilot ne didn't necessarily mean that you had to come from the upper classes. So eventually the, it becomes a very egalitarian um, uh, air force. And towards the end, some of the, um, the aces that come out of America, for example, are just farm boys um, that, are, that have just been, just found that they had the skill set. Um, all right, so you've got these simple planes which were mainly box frames with paper covering canvas that's been tightened or paper covering, as I said, that has been doped to stretch it. But they started to then develop solid timber into bench sections that were, were laminated together with glues. And it gave them a more streamlined effect. And so the airflow over the aircraft would then improve so their top speed would go up. And that was important too if you're a, in a fighter plane. You've either got to have top speed to get on top of the guy in front of you, so you can shoot at him, or to get away from the guy who's on your tail. Um, these types of airplanes, the Germans were very good at designing these things. You know, the British tend to have more square shapes, and so a lot of the German aircraft look really neat and tidy and very streamlined looking. But you're still hanging a little bit on to the old. You notice my also here, they've still got the wire bracings coming through, very light, can't see it. The thing here that's important in this one is that it's got that forward-facing top mounted through the propeller gun. That particular concept of shooting through the propeller was, was a unique idea. It had to be geared down to the engine so that as the propeller was coming, otherwise you shoot your own propeller off. So that's not a very good idea. So you could only shoot as the propeller was in that gap part. So you only had a two-part propeller, which meant that for no, well, for 50% of the time, there was no propeller there. Right. So really, you, you had a pretty good margin from which to, to shoot through. But it's still a unique idea. And, they, and that be, meant that the, the pilot, the fighter pilot, could point his plane at someone. Now, this is where the skill set stuff comes in. And I'll just um, give you an indication of 
what sorts of things you had to consider as a pilot. Let's go to the other screen. I like the black one. So we'll go to the black one. All right. I'll go to being white. Okay. One of the things you tried to do was when you had a pilot come onto your tail from above, they climb above and try to attack out of the sun over your shoulder. That made them less visible and you also had a certain amount of speed that you could dive on top of the plane in front of you. So you've got these two planes perhaps coming at each other and one's coming up from behind. So what you're trying to do in the front plane is get out of his, his shot. So you start a turn and you might climb, you might dive, get speed, but you're turning. And as you're turning, he'll start to turn as well to try and keep on your tail. Now here's where it's really important because the plane that can turn a tighter circle can finish up either going from in front to behind or get around onto the curve of the plane that is turning. So he's coming around trying to get away from you, but you've got a tighter curve or a different kind of curve and you are bringing your plane around. Now this is something you don't think about because you're not actually you know, uh, aware of the physics in the sky. This is a three-dimensional flight, three-dimensional arena in which you're flying. Um, it's not like being on the ground and firing at someone who's also on the ground. The plane can be doing three or four things. It can be going up, down, turning, going away from you, towards you, slowing down, trying to o let you overfly. All these tricks that these guys had to come up with. Now, the guy who could do this the best usually survived these encounters, which meant that he could then come up and do another encounter and he has learnt something from that process. The other one is that the skill set that allows one final thing is that you need to be able to, in your head, calculate when to fire the gun you have, which has limited ammunition. They load the ammunition on the ground. When you get up there, you've only got what's in the, what is on the belt or what's in the container that's holding the bullets. There might only be 10 seconds, 15 seconds worth of firing. So you've flown for an hour or half an hour to get to the battle site. You've got five minutes of fighting time. And in that time, you probably only press the button twice, three times. You don't want to be doing too much because you run out of bullets. All right. So it's really crucial that you don't waste your shot. Now, here's the problem. When you fire a gun, the bullets start trajectory down. That's gravity. So no matter what speed they've come out the front, they are going to start to head down. So as you come into the position where you want to fire on this guy, you have to then raise the plane up and fire where he isn't. You don't fire at the plane. It's, a, it's, it's quite strange. You've got to actually fire to somewhere like here so that the bullets, say you're firing now, the bullets are leaving your plane and flying up in the air and then coming down and they actually come down onto the top of the plane. So in these movies, when they're right behind and that, and they're firing from behind, he's probably going to miss. The bullets are probably going to go underneath. So the real films should have them sort of coming around and firing and let the, the, the plane flies up, shoots, and the bullets arc and hit the plane as it goes underneath. So you don't actually, you, you literally fly into the stream of bullets. Now you can think that through in your head, the physics that goes on. Not everybody can do that. When you get really good at it, they called you an ace. And you got a fair bit of fame out of that. And the famous ace, of course, from World War I is Baron von Richthofen, or the Red Baron. So if I go back to the computer now. And another thing about the aircraft design was that, and that's the famous plane for the Baron, the triplane. Now here's another thing. If you can turn tighter, that gives you the advantage of getting that, that lead that you can fire into the plane. But to turn tighter, you pull more Gs. There's more gravity in the tighter turns being acted on you, also on the plane. Now, if you've got one of those planes with just a small wing, a single wing, you've got to have a long wing to get the lift, right? Now, long wings are cantilevers, so they're going to have at the ends when you're turning the pressure and bending and g-forces that you are putting by your mass in turning the corner onto the spar where it's attached to you in the fuselage. 
if the plane isn't well made, you could literally rip the wings off of it. And in some situations, that happened. Pilots who were trying desperately to get out of the road turned so quickly or dove. Another way to, remember I said there was three dimensional fighting? So if you wanted to minimize the three dimensions, you went for the ground. Because when you're down low, it makes it more difficult for the guy to get on, onto you. You can't come up from underneath because you've eliminated one particular area of the arena. So you've seen a lot of movies where they dive for the trees. And they're also hoping that by weaving through that, it gets rid of the advantage that the guy had in height uh, because he can't then climb and get accelerated heights. During World War II, this technique of trying to get onto the tails, the planes were so equally maxed, matched that in some situations, battles would be fought by two planes just spiraling for 10 minutes trying to get an advantage one over the other. One chasing the tail of the other one. No one willing to blink because the bloke who drops will be then dived on. The bloke who climbs will lose speed and get caught up with. So you could get into this sort of continuous turn just waiting for somebody to make a mistake. So designing the aircraft to give you the advantage was where it was at. And again, engineers get called in. And one of the solutions was we don't want long wings. We want our lift. So we want to be able to carry the mass. So why don't we make the wing area by cutting it into sections and mounting it in the third section? It also, sh so by that virtue, then you can turn faster. I've actually seen film of one of these guys who was a good pilot at this, making this thing skid in the air. So you basically would come along, somebody would get on behind you and he's got your, you got your triplane in the front. And because you throw the rudder over him, because it's got enough lift, it didn't have to have speed over the wing so much. It'd turn like that and still fly and it'd knock off all the speed, so this bloke is diving on you, suddenly goes around there, and you just turn and chase him. So a remarkable advantage for that. And I've seen it done, so it's like, wow, how do you do that? You skid the plane, and then straighten it back up, and you're on the tail. But designing for the forces now becomes the big issue. All right, so now you've, you've, got, you've got things that have happened. You've got wooden cowlings, big engines, shooting through the front, triplane, get the area of the wings, and so on. All right. The other area that was being developed was the big, big planes, the bombers. And these were deliberately to try and take the war beyond the front to other areas, the supplying of the front. So it became a very uh, important strategic advantage to actually go and find where the stuff that's coming from, the rail yards behind the lines. By the time the, war got, the First World War got settled into Europe, down into the seven, 18, seven, 1979 and the 17 and 1918, they were in these trenches and dug, and you, they were used to being bombarded. I mean, you've seen pictures of the films of the, the fields after the bombardments. There's no trees left anywhere. So that wasn't going to work. So you go and try and get to the back fields. Now again, fighters would be used in order to attack them. So you tended to, um, I think the next one, you had a fairly large crew. And in that crew, there might be four or five guys whose job it is, one guy might be sitting up the front with a gun, a guy down in the middle at the back. Another bloke actually was on the sides, two sides. Becomes a similar sort of thing you see in World War II. You're trying to protect the bomber. You've got no maneuverability. You can't get into one of these dogfight situations. You just keep flying straight and you get bristly. Just fire at them. And you know that the fighter is so fast that basically he has to slow down to shoot at you, which makes him vulnerable, or dive past you quickly and take a shot, which means you've only got a very short time, and then he's got to turn and try and come back on you. So bombers, you know, the, the military attitudes towards these things, you know, this is how you develop strategies and stuff. But look at the size of this thing, the, the size of the motors involved by now. The technologies had got to the place, and they accelerate because of the war. There has been some argument that most of our greatest inventions are the results of conflicts like this. Because what it does is it forces nation to give their best, best uh, engineers the most opportunity in the shortest time frames. Um, you don't want to, uh, and it also apparently is very good for your economy if, you're, if you finish up winning, because you know, you've got all this infrastructure that you put together. Um, America fi found that very much the case in World War I and World War II when they were supplying what was needed to the fronts, tanks and other things and boats and such like. 
Okay. Now, something else that's fairly important, which we've neglected to talk about, is that the other type of material you could use for aircraft would have been, logically, to use some form of steel. Now, they were using steel, or at least metals, in some of the wiring and connections and tie rods and, and cabling and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, the motors are metal and very heavy, but the frames at this point hadn't really gotten into being made of anything else. Now, just prior to World War I, 10, 15 years beforehand, the discoveries, or at least the advances that had been found in, in electronics that allowed for generating high current and the development of arc, first for lighting, sort of just the idea of jumping a spark across between the high voltage areas, but arc furnaces, where you could generate really high temperatures, sufficiently high enough to reduce aluminium. Now, we mentioned this once before, that aluminium was at one stage a very valuable material. Almost overnight, once they started realizing it's literally dirt from the ground outside, picked up, well, not in that concentration, but you can find it in concentrations large enough for it to make it viable. Reduce it, get rid of the oxygen, get rid of the other things that are attached to it, make it pure, and you found yourself with a really cool, reasonably strong, lightweight metal that can be formed like many other metals joined like many other metals and if you make them in the right sparring shapes like i-beams or bent sections you get yourself a rigid material that could be used to replace the wooden spars and the, the edges on on the planes that were already made up of wood the first place this got used was in the zeppelins um, they are very large aluminium structures and they were as i mentioned before they were filled with hydrogen and of course, this particular group of Zeppelins, um, they're called Zeppelins after the name of the guy who invented the process for it, and, or invented the idea, well not invented, but made the money available to make these things and design these things. But again, I said the other day, see the size of the area underneath for taking people on journeys. Now this is actually taken after the war. Uh, one of the things with Germany that uh, got them back into the game, if you like, was that they were very successful at their engineering. Um, so between the wars, they, they were quite remarkable in some of the things they did. Um, so aluminium comes on board, which means, um, oh, something else about after the war. So we got, we got these things back here. You've got a whole bunch of guys who flew these types of aircraft, well-trained, their skill sets are really high, and they can do weird things with planes, turn them around, fly them upside down, all that sort of stuff. And they've all been demobbed at the end of the war. We've got no use for pilots now because we're not fighting anybody. So what do they do? Particularly in America, they go back to their own states and they realize there's not a lot of work. You know, so I've got a skill set that I was given, that's flying. So they pick up an old aircraft, that, you know, like an old plane that no one wanted from the war, leftover stuff, and they start flying around the country giving joyrides and putting on shows. And this is called barnstorming. And you could go to a field, because they'd land in a field. They're small planes, they fly really slow. Uh, people hadn't been in the air, it was a novelty. Flying was such great fun sort of thing. So you could go to a show, a country fair, and there'd be a plane there, an ex-fighter pilot or a pilot was just survived the war, and he'd take you up for a dollar, whatever. And a lot of people who became pilots for World War II got their first taste of flying as a result of barnstorming events. And they end, then they started to go, well, all of, some of these guys were risk takers. Right? They enjoyed some of the adrenaline rush that was involved in flying planes fast and in competition with each other. But they couldn't actually shoot the other guy down, not in peacetime anyway, that's, not, that's frowned upon. So what they decided to do instead was that they would all get together and race. Oh, going the wrong way. That's gone right back. Okay. There we go. So by the time you get to the mid-1930s, 1930s, here it's 10th anniversary. So they've been flying air races for 10 years. So they start in 1920 here. And air races were around pylons. Now, we still do this. We still got air races. And a couple of years ago, I remember that it was very popular to watch air races with the Red Bull team being the one fastest plane and stuff like this. And I watched it a couple of times and I said, you guys are nuts. That is, that's, I thought Formula One racing was crazy. 
but flying an airplane at the speeds they're going, at the distance off the ground they are, because they've got to fly under things and around things, and they've got to zigzag, oh, it's just madness. But it all comes out of this challenging each other with these old planes. But the money that went into it, because people would, they used to race over lakes and airfields so that they could get the crowd to see the planes flying. So they have these two pylons, maybe two, three kilometers apart, and they'd race around the pylons, just like a motor race. Right? And people would go to them and watch them, and there was so much money in the prize money, they started to actually go, well, we want to see who is the fastest. We want to do something like Grand Prix racing was becoming in Europe with cars. It's just like most, most what, what humans do, isn't it? Uh, is we, we, we want to challenge each other, and particularly the blokes. The blokes seem to want to bang heads, and so we've got to have a go. Who is the best? And so who's got the most money? And who can do the most designs and things like this? And one of the planes that finished up winning the speed record. Now, two things about this particular aircraft that I want to point out. First is obvious. It doesn't have an undercarriage. It's got floats. Because there weren't many airdromes around. Many fields in which you could land planes and not at this point, it was only just starting that the, there were cities putting in airfields. So you could always find a lake to land on or something close by or a river or something like that, as long as the weather wasn't too bad. Um, and a lot of these races, as I said, were over water. And over water, you can fly straight and flat because, and fast because um, you know, a couple of other things that come in here. Being close to the ground is actually a benefit when you are a propeller-driven aircraft. I'll give you a few moments to think about that. As you climb up in altitude, the air gets less. So if you want to grab the air with a propeller, you are more likely to get better speed at a lower altitude. Unfortunately, there are things down low that make that problematic. Trees, buildings, mountains. Well, yeah, people, you'd have to be, you'd have to be flying really low to hit a people, right. But over a lake or over the ocean or stuff like that, you can go flat out and you're pretty much sure, unless you don't pay attention and hit a boat, um, that you're going to be able to go pretty quick. Now, this particular group here, this, this was um, the first of the designs that were these long, sleek, very smooth, aerodynamic. They were really considering now, and I'll talk in the next session about the problem of moving an airplane through air. But for now, we're just looking at the materials being used and the engineering principles. That particular shape, one of them that comes out of this is the Supermarine Group who use Rolls-Royce Merlin engines from Britain. Now these are V12 engines. This is not a small plane. Right? There aren't too many cars with V12s in them anymore. So you think Rolls-Royce engine shoved to the front of a plane and a sleek, sort of very smooth looking aircraft. That was done as design for this type of racing. That would finish up being the design for the Spitfire during World War II. The Supermarine becomes the Spitfire because of the shape. So if you think the, the beauty of that aircraft and go back to these guys who are doing this stuff. The other thing that happens is that as the war ends, those bombers that you are making with the big engines we got no use for bombers anymore. So what they did was make them a little bit smaller, still very robust. This is also made of metal now, the aluminiums on the outside of the aircraft. You don't even bother painting them because it's nice and shiny and it looks fantastic. So you don't have to worry about the colouring on them. This particular one uses a Ford motor. Um, one of the ones that came out of the end of the war is a particular designer with an unfortunate name, and you've got to be careful how you pronounce it, Fokker, his aircraft, particularly the triplane, uh, was very, very popular after the war for transportation. And the thing they were using most of the time was to use it for mail, because you now deliver large packages, um, uh, mail, even uh, goods and services could be delivered from country to country or from uh, one part of the United States to the other part of the United States. One of the first places in the world to do this was here. Australia is very progressive with the use of aircraft because Australia has big distances. 
So it was very quick that the Australians went, well, we'll do this too. Um, you, I'll show you in a moment one of the planes that you be, should be familiar with that did this sort of stuff. Um, actually, we'll go to it. So you've got the aircraft there that would be for that purpose. This one, Southern Cross. All right? And this is the triplane. This is Ford Motors on a triplane design, which is based on the Fokker train, pl triplane um, of, th of the tri-engine, tri-motor. And what uh, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith and, and Ulm would do was prove that you could do long-haul flights in these types of aircraft because you could carry enough fuel to go long distances because they're big. They've got three engines, so if you have a failure of one, you've certainly got enough time to make a decision about whether you turn back or keep going. There's a classic story, apparently, of one flight that they were flying from Australia to New Zealand, and the co-pilot, Charles Ulm, um, he realized that there was a lack of oil in one motor and they were starting to lose the second motor so he climbed out onto the motor that had died grabbed the oil and climbs back through the plane to the other wing and pours the oil into the plane that the other motor so they could get through to new zealand um, all out and open of course no no safety nets no catches to hold on to or anything like that Anyway, so that's, that's one of those bravery stories for these guys. They were trailblazers. They, they really were risking things. Um, the American that would try this across the Atlantic is Lindbergh. He becomes a national hero for flying across the Atlantic. In a not same plane, but a similar sort of robust aircraft that can go a long distance. So we were good at it. We had the distances to fly these things. Plus, we're so far away from England that flight seemed to be a solution to a problem. So we started to look for mail routes back to England and from England to us. And Charles Kingsford Smith was part of that process. The other one that's cool is that a group of people got together in, out of Longreach in Queensland and they set up a company that would start doing this sort of stuff for pay. You know, like not for postage services for the government, or something like that, but you could, you could actually sit in on a flight. At first, the mail was more important. You could hitch a ride on a mail flight by sitting on the bags in the back. You might pay the pilot a couple of bucks for doing it. But passenger aircraft weren't in the frame at the moment. It was all about delivering these sorts of things. Along comes this company in, in Longreach. Um, they have the initials for Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial service. Who am I talking about? Qantas. Qantas. One of the first airlines, um, actually I think it is the first airline to be incorporated in the world. It's Australian. Qantas. Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Service. And another cool thing we used to do, which is similar to this, is that we would send doctors out into the remote areas to service the air, the flying doctor service. Again, another good Australian idea that everybody else in the world took on straight away. Of course, we use helicopters now more than we use planes to do that, although we still use fixed-winged aircraft. Um, a lot of places in the world use helicopters to deliver their emergency services. By the time we get to the mid-30s, those bomber aircraft and that steel framing has started to change into some really nice designs. This design, this is the Douglas DC-3. They are still flying today. They are still used for military purposes. They are so robust and so well designed that they often fly in places no other aircraft will fly. Into the deserts, to Antarctica, you know, where the engines can maintain, because they're reasonably hot engines and they, can, you know, like they, they don't have the issues of airflows that the, the modern engines do. It's still a beautiful looking aircraft. Right? It's one of the first that was designed with passengers in mind. And you know this because it's got something the mail planes don't have. Windows. Windows. And people were intrigued to fly. They still thought they would get... At, at first, you, know, you had to be really rich to fly. Because as you can imagine, if you can carry stuff you don't have to feed, Stuff you don't have to let go to the toilet. Stuff you don't have to um, be overly concerned about how you get them on and off and their comfort. And you can pack them to the hilt. So mail bags and, and boxes and stuff for people in there. That's going to be where the money is. Right? 
When you start carrying people, in order to make it cost effective, they have to be charged a very lot of money. Now most people in, the day, in this day were traveling by train, particularly in the US. They would, if you had long distance to go with business trips, you'd go by train. And the train network in America was quite, quite extensive. So you'd just pick a town you wanted to go to and there'd be a, probably a railroad company that took you straight there from New York or from any of the big centers. But the train probably was an overnighter so that you could sleep, so you could go from one day to another day and have your business in both country, both cities, like from New York to Chicago or something like that. When you started to be able to fly there in an hour or an hour and a half, and you could do business in one place and be back that same day, then businessmen started to say, well, this is actually worthwhile because I'm not losing an overnight, I'm not losing a day in the process. So they were paying the money. And it's still the case today that airplanes are used mainly for business, for people who travel. Well, and, and now tourism's a big deal as well. But that's the beginning of, and again, what we're looking at is from an engineering perspective, airflow, large still propeller, still petrol engines, um, retractable wheel carriage so that you can get less airflow uh, or less disruption to the airflow, as we'll talk about that in the next section. Um, similar design, basically all the same, and swept back wings now. They're starting to realize that you can get lift out on the edges of wings, but you, you've also got a problem of something as the air tumbles off the edge of the wing, and that is causes a turbulence at the sides of the wings, and you change your design, which will increase the problem of drag. Yeah, we've come to drag in a, in a little while. Um, steel, uh, not steel, probably an aluminium frame inside. Some steel would have been used and um, it's skinned. Now, some of them were riveted so that you could replace panels. You can come along and take the panels off. Flush riveting would be that you'd make it so that you could have a countersunk hole that the rivet went into, then you'd grind the top of the rivet off and the airflow over that would be good. Um, some military aircraft, they didn't care about that because they weren't worried about fuel efficiency or going, getting uh, the best out of the aircraft, so they just bolted them together as best they could. Mass get them, get them out and get them going. Um, and later on in World War II, this aircraft gets converted into military purposes and it becomes the famous plane for the parachute drops at D-Day, uh, Arnhem, and, and you know, the classic films that you see in shows like Band of Brothers, air filled with these uh, brown gray uh, looking DC-3s and pi piles of guys pouring out the back of them. Um, when transportation became a viable proposition, long distance travel now from continent to continent became reasonably important. These big flying boats called clippers. Now I mentioned before that the little planes with the floats had already introduced the idea of landing on water allowed you to land just about anywhere. The problem with a really big aircraft that has the sorts of facilities on board for you to have a reasonable trip for five, six, seven hours between two countries flying across the Atlantic, for example. Lindenburg, Lindbergh has shown it's possible. You just have to make it so that the plane will survive the trip and you've got enough room for people to make it worth your while. So it becomes cost effective. Problem is, there's no runways large enough for these things to land on. So they became waterborne. And this particular one, I think, is actually one of the clipper ships that flew here to Australia and Rose Bay in Sydney was a landing port for them. And they'd land in the harbour by coming in through the heads, landing on that long section up to try and pull up before uh, Fort Denison and then turn into Rose Bay in that area. And there was a docking section for that. We had one here for the military out at um, uh, Sanctuary Point uh, where the, what's it called? There's a restaurant there on the corner uh, and it's, isn't it called the platform or something? the landing zone or something like that. Um, it's, it's got a name that's related to the fact that it used to be where the seaplanes would come in and land on basin view, on, on the basin, because it was flat body of water. They didn't land in Jervis Bay because you got the wind up in there too much. But anyway, uh, and then you peeled it, there's a road that goes down, it's where Sanctuary Point Road goes down, meets the point, and that used to be a um, uh, docking area for these sorts of planes, not that sort, because that's too big, but planes that would fly between cities and military aircraft. But the size of them, I mean, you can see that the, the, the accommodation in these, it matches 
probably in terms of, because it's mainly people with a lot of money, um, probably the same sort of thing you'd get in the first class version of one of the big A380s no, or the, you know, the DC-10s or the, even the 747 that, that we look at in a moment. Something, a lot of space, but you couldn't land them anywhere, so you had to land them on water. Next thing is that we find that um, if you want to take advantage of some of the air streams that are available that you can get into and move through very quickly, um, these sorts of bodies of mass air movement that occur at certain altitudes, you can get up to them just with propellers. You can just make it to them and you can fly in them. But there's a big problem. Is that when you get up there, you've got altitude and you've got lack of air and you've got lack of pressure. So you're flying at lower altitude, uh, lower atmosphere. It's not very good for people. So these things were limited. They could get bulky. This is one of the first to try and get that problem of landing on an airfield sorted. So now you, you've got them bulky, but they're short. Um, you, get it, you can get the airfields now. They make an airfield large enough. But you're going to have a limit to the height you can go. You've got a limit to where you can get up to because you've got the problem of um, making the cabin available for people to sit in. At first, when you start looking at bombers from uh, leading into World War II, this one's actually out of World War II towards the end, um, you've got two options with bombers. During World War II at the beginning, the American idea of what to do with bombers was to put so many guns on them and fly in formation, these were called flying fortresses, and fly in such a formation that no one would dare attack you because you'd have to go through a hail of bullets to get to them. Right. Then someone comes up with the idea of why don't we just fly higher than they can go? If they're propeller-driven aircraft, they've got limits to how they can perform at high altitude, so we'll go up really high. So they built these planes that could go to very high altitude and therefore fly higher than the defenders or for the uh, attacking planes. They put their pilots on oxygen. So they developed all this masking technology that would deliver oxygen to it. But that was so cumbersome too and the pilots couldn't operate really well with it. It would be much better if you could fly in an environment that was more like normal. To do that, you need a pressure cylinder. So you need to create a lightweight tube that could be pressurized so that you could fly at altitude. And guess what? That makes it good for people too. So after the war, the lessons learned on high altitude bombers could be converted into a new technology that was just around the corner. So bombers become important for the views towards transportation, and particularly into the modern era. Well, end of World War II, we find that the Germans had gotten some very cool designs out. Britain had them too. Britain was working on a jet pilot, the Gloucester Company was working on a, a jet. Um, the video you're what you, you can watch online about the origins of the jet engine shows you that it was largely a British push the German version was quick and nasty, often killed the pilots more than some of the pilots died, and particularly in the jet one, the rocket ones they had. They had a rocket plane that would go up really quick to get to these high altitude bombers the Americans were bringing in, um, and they often blew up. You know, you'd be running, flying down the airdrome, and plus you had no power afterwards. Once the rocket had run out, you had to land quickly in the space you had to land in, and you got no control. So, a bit risky. But they were losing the war by that time, so they were prepared to take risks. But they did come up with one really good one. And this Misha Schmidt was one of the first very successful jet fighters. Um, the Americans found when they, the, the, just 1944, towards the end of the war, they started flying, these things would come through, and they didn't even know what they were looking at. They just went straight through the ranks, fired, fired as they went through. You didn't even have time to react, they were going that quick. But the fighter planes that they had, the fastest ones they had were like the Mustang and the Thunderbolt. These were really big engine Thunderbolt and the Mustang was a really sleek looking aircraft. Um, both of them were capable of doing something in 500, 550 knots. These things are traveling to 600 knots. That's, that's, you know, just that little bit of advantage. So you, if, you, if you had them on your tail, they'd fly past, shoot you and then disappear and you would never catch them. Um, so they were a bit scary. 
Um, had they had these things perhaps a year before, there may have been a different outcome to World War II, and at least maybe Germany might not have had to surrender completely because they might have been able to sue for a peace of some sort. Just came too late. But isn't it a pretty plane? <laughs> Apart from the fact that it looks like a shark, you know, everybody thinks it looks like a shark, you know, because they do the colouring too and the dappleness. By the way, look, why did they do that? Yeah, so if you're coming up from underneath and you look up and it's coming out of the sun, you don't see it. It's, it's just white, white on white. Yeah. And when you look down, it looks like any of the other terrain through the greyness of the air. Yeah, so camouflaging was also about keeping them unseen when people were flying over and you were trying to hide them in fields and stuff too. Anyway, very nice aircraft. So jet engines were one of the big deals to come out of World War II. This aircraft. All right. <laughs> It looks like what? Uh, the one they had in Superman. In Superman. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. It doesn't look like... Oh, but actually, they're still flying. Um, this is the de Havilland, uh, and it's the Comet. Uh, I don't know the designation number. They have them like de Havilland DH-5 or some DH-1. Um, it's one of the first deliberately built for people to travel in, so a passenger aircraft, that was a jet engine aircraft. But what's really cool about it is the... Jets are integrated into the fuselage with these really big, good wings, and it was a pressurized container, aluminium skinned, very, very comfortable, carried about 25 to 30 people and a crew of four, something of that on that order. The problem with this one was that it, it had, it got into service first before something else. Boeing were building their zone, Boeing were doing bombers during the war. So they were taking some of their knowledge from their bombers and their jet bombers into, world, into the use in um, commercial aircraft. The, the bombers that, the, that they did during the war had underslung jet engines. And they did that so that they could service them. Military servicing was much quicker and you needed to get them up in the air and you could take the whole engine off, throw it away, put a new one on quickly. If it's integrated into the wing and stuff, a like, little bit more time on the grounds needed just to get to things. You can't just bol unbolt an engine and drop it off and put another one on if it breaks. Right? So there was a technique in mind of the Americans that would hang the jets underneath the wings. The 707, when it comes out, about three or four years after this one, this is early, late 40s, this being designed, and it's in service in the early 50s. By the mid-50s, Boeing had released the 707. Um, so the 707 is a classic one you see in the pictures with the air engines under, under the slung, under the wings. Right. This plane, because it was in the air first, was the first to experience something that no one had seen before. And that was that when you start going up and pressurizing a cylinder, and then you come back down again and depressurize, and you go up and pressurize, and you go back down, over a period of time, the expansion and contraction and pressures on the shell, on the containment, introduced changes into the metals. You were starting to find something known as fatigue. Now fatigue was known about because metals would collapse after a period of time and they knew that it would happen. They just didn't realize the effect of temperature, altitude, and the constant up and down cyclic loading that resulted from pressurization and depressurization. Next, there was a fundamental small flaw in the design of this aircraft. At the top, at the back here, there's a radio mask that would come out in flight in order for them to communicate with airdromes and keep a track of where they're at. For some peculiar reason, they decided that when they do it, they'd make it roughly a square to match the panel that they put in, and they put a series of little screws or rivets in and around that very, very close to the corners. Now, we know from what we've looked at in the course already, that when you have corners, you have a position where the stress has to go around the corner and it's a stress raiser. Then if you drill holes into the material, you, you stress that material in drilling the hole and then you stress it again when you punch it with a rivet. So you now have compounded some of the stresses into localized sections. Then you do this fatigue thing. And the unfortunate thing is not knowing that this was coming down the pipe, an aircraft crashes in the Mediterranean, killing everybody, just 
They had no idea what happened. They actually thought there must have been a bomb on it because they were, the British were having some trouble with some of the people around the Mediterranean because the British had a, an influence, particularly in Palestine and around Egypt and into other places like Malta and such. So there was, you know, terrorism is not a completely new idea, right? So at first they wondered what had happened. They maybe thought someone had brought a bomb onto the plane. Um, particularly as there was a um, eyewitnesses, some fishing boats and things said that the thing was already falling apart when it fell out of the sky and hit the ocean. It was very difficult to find the pieces too because the ocean area there was, was quite deep. They thought about maybe there was a problem with the design, but they, you know, what, they thought, what would, would it be? What could it be? It's really good, the, the aircraft's fine. They couldn't, can't think of anything that it might be. So they didn't, didn't know what to do. So they grounded the aircraft and started looking for all the design possibilities. Right? About two weeks later, another one crashes. Then they say, right, that's it. We're not flying any more comets now. So the British aircraft industry grinds to a halt and the company that was running these planes, British Airways, had to stop flying, which was a great economic cost to them. Right? They eventually do something that no one had thought about doing before. And I've got a video for you to watch that you can get online and it's the story of the Comet aircraft. And basically what they do is they build a water tank large enough to put a fuselage for this aircraft into the water tank so that they can do the pressurization testing. They do the first sort of deliberate braking tests to see where it breaks. Then at the same time, luckily, the, the Navy, the British Navy was looking for the parts of the plane. They found one of the parts of the plane they brought it up and they started looking at the conditions of the plane. They started to see things from some of the areas that they knew that the plane had disintegrated in the air. For example, this is going to sound a bit, a bit off, but there was an imprint of a coin on the tail section of the aircraft. And the only way that could happen is if it, the aircraft had blown open and the coin was in somebody's pocket or something like that and it hit the plane and so on. And the other thing is they found one or two bodies. And when they looked at the bodies, they found that the bodies, they were dead before they hit the water. They didn't drown. What they showed evidence of was that their lungs had exploded. And that was due to the fact that you had a rapid depressurization. You're at altitude. Um, your, your lungs, it's like getting the bends really quickly. You, the, the difference between the air outside and the air inside is, is so much your air expands in your lungs. And, and it's not very pleasant. Right, so they found that. So they, they, they were aware that something catastrophe had happened up in the air. So they do the investigation and they were one of the first to do this. But by the time they got the results, the 707 was on the market. The 707 learnt from the results, started redesigning and backfitting. And the Comet, even though it was a really cool aircraft, never recovered as a passenger aircraft, unfortunately. So the military bought them. And they're still flying. I think they're still flying. They were flying them up to about 10 years ago as maritime search and rescue planes, particularly in the North Atlantic. Okay. Almost modern era. We'll stop after this because we need to look at some other things and give you a break. Big, large, well-designed, modern jet planes. Now, believe it or not, you know, believe it or not, I'm old enough to remember when that plane rolled out. And that image is very familiar to me. The 707 was very famous intercontinental plane. People were flying. I didn't know anybody at school who had flown in an aircraft, right? Because I'm from the western suburbs of Sydney, no one had the money, all right? But I got to year seven and one boy had enough money with his family to fly to England. And they went on a 747. And I was so envious, because this was the ant's pants when it came out. This was the pinnacle of flight. We just figured that's it, we've done it now, we don't have to design anymore. You can't get any better than the 747. But of course, there's a lot of changes, which we'll talk about later after the next couple of class courses or units, about modern aircraft and what they're made like and what is an A380 Airbus all about, you know? Um, and why is it that back when they made these, the seats were really large and you could really, really luxurious because they, they sold it on the basis of space, all right? Now, aircraft accidents have always taken place in flight. Even back in the 30s, people still got killed being passenger plane pilots, passenger planes and passengers. You know. There's been some famous ones some big ones. 
lots of deaths and stuff. But apparently, from what I understood now, you, air flight and passenger flights are so safe that what I, the stat I heard last week or the week before last was that you would have to fly for 120 years every day for 120 years before you'd have any chance of being in an accident of any kind on an aircraft. Flying is the safest you'll ever be. Um, I, when we flew to New Zealand just recently for a holiday, I was talking to my wife when we were up at cruising altitude and I said, you do realize now for the next hour while we're up at our 30,000 feet in our nice comfortable pressurized aircraft where the engines are just humming along and they're not doing any work. They're not being labored, they're not doing any work. Basically, we are right this moment the safest we'll ever be in our lives. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, you're joking. And I said, nope, statistically, for this hour, I, if I could stay here for the rest of my life, I would be as safe as I've ever been. Because there's probably medical staff on board, there's bound to be a doctor or a nurse somewhere in the, in the crew, you know, there's bound to be. But people still see flight as dangerous and unsafe. It's, un, it's remarkable. You, you know the stats. You're more likely to get in an accident driving to the airport or home from the airport than when you're actually in the aircraft. Um, so relax, enjoy the flight. All right, this is your captain speaking. <laughs> even the terrorist stuff, even though they have multiplied the chances because people don't normally blow up planes, but they do sometimes happen. The, if, if you, but if you go and look at the number of planes that have been actually blown up in the air and look at the number, where you're more, the, the bigger consequence right now is when you fly over zones where there's nutters. Like the, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the plane that got shot down um, by the, the well, I've got to be politically correct here and say someone in that Crimean area, whether it was Russian or not, I don't know, but somebody brought down that commercial aircraft. There's problems with that. That commercial aircraft probably should never have been flying over that because they were all pilots and given a warning that, you know, this area's got some military activity going on. Um, something that I probably could talk about very briefly, um, just to finish that off, because of going, getting back to the military perspective on things, um, when the Vietnam War was on, uh, the Americans had got themselves to a pretty good place in designing fighter planes, and they had some really fast fighter jets. The Korean War brought that to the head, where the Russians and the Chinese, or the Chinese were flying Russian-built MiGs, and the Americans were flying their, their famous Sabre jets. And they had good things about them. The, the MiGs uh, were very robust. The, um, the Sabres tended to have a bit of turning circle and these sorts of battles would be determined by pilot more than anything else because the planes were so evenly matched. By the time you get to Vietnam, they had started to use their fighters for attack, ground attack. Um, and there's this famous one they have called a Phantom. I think it's the F-15 or something like that. It's one of the designations, f mean fighter. Um, the Phantom jet, and when you see it, it's this huge, big, solid jet that could land on boats so it could be delivered, so they had to be able to land on aircraft carriers. But it was literally America's proof to the world with a big enough engine, even a brick will fly. All right? So it's just this big, solid thing that could take all these hits. And the reason that they were successful in Vietnam is that something had started that when you went down to do ground attack with a jet, particularly out of fighting in Korea, where they were blowing up infrastructure and bridges. There's a movie called The Bridges at Tokyo Ri, which is about that particular sort of thing. They started to put money into firing little rockets at you, either land-based rockets that were on, on the ground, and they started to put a lot of technology into chasing you on heat-seeking rockets or radar-directed rockets. But by the time you get to Vietnam, they had these things called SAMs, surface-to-air missiles, that were shoulder-mounted. So in the jungles, you're flying down to come along to do a attack on a bridge or a village, and a guy is sitting in the, knows which direction you're gonna come from, by the way, because they want, no, this is the best way to attack. So they position themselves, and they just pop out from behind the trees, and they've got these little rockets. Now, when you're firing a rocket up towards an aircraft that is flying at a height, there's generally time for you to make a reaction. So a lot of the pilots would have things like stuff to throw out the back, uh, there's this, yeah, the flares would be the heat seekers, um, little confetti of metal, that would be to disrupt the radar ones that are being you know, directed by other means. 
Um, so there were all these defense mechanisms. But when you're down low, doing an attack, and the missile's fired, you've got no time. So they were very successful. And so it changed the warfare a little bit because here's this multi-million dollar aircraft with two very highly trained individuals in the plane that you spent a lot of money on. And here's a bloke in sandals with a $2,000 missile bringing the whole thing apart. That's still one of the big problems for the aircraft industry and, and particularly the military is that you spend a lot of money on building these things and just one missile will take you out. And it was one of those types of surface-to-air missiles that was fired on that aircraft, um, what is it, two years ago now? Yeah, something like that. But anyway, all right, so we're just going to fold that idea up. Just revisit the three or four major things. First, a lot of these things were, a lot of developments in aircraft and flight were developed because of changes in the technologies at the time and the, the development materials, uh, propulsion systems, like you can't have a jet engine until you get a jet, right? Or jet, or you can't have a jet plane until you get a jet engine, rather. So you have to have those things developed. You can't have a jet engine until you develop te um, high temperature resistant materials that can go into the fan blades, and the fan rotors are going to have to spin fast enough to make it worth your while to get the compression strokes that you need. We'll talk more about jet engines in a little while. As you go into uh, flight, you start to use them for military purposes and the ones who come up with the greatest advantage. So you start to make a lot of changes to get uh, advantages like turning, um, height altitude, bringing in pressurized systems that then get converted into personal private use, transportation for people. It, it, it flows. What's driving things today tends to be the commercial side, it's still about money, but where these these guys came from, even the swept back wing arrangement, all that out of the military side and the developments that are related to military purposes. Right? So just make the connections and think about the society today and what it would be like if we didn't have intercontinental communications and transportations like aircraft. Where might it go in the future? Right, there are, there's some talk about engines, which again, when we talk about jet engines, we'll see why jet engines are limited. But there's a group of engines that are coming out called ramjets and scramjets that operate at very high altitude. And basically, once you get them going, they run themselves. Um, and that's extraordinary, so they're very efficient. But to get to the altitudes is the problem. Once you're up there, you can fly very, very, very fast. There's talk of flying from Sydney to London in an hour, hour and a half. And the majority of the trip will be getting up to the altitude and coming down from the altitude. So the first 25 minutes of the flight might be going up, the second to 25 minutes might be coming down, and the middle 15 to 20 minutes is getting from Western Australia to Europe where you start to decelerate and come down because of the speeds they can do. Um, remarkable, definitely. I think I remember that they, I think two years, three years ago, they tested one of those. Yeah, so it was one tested over Western Australia. Yeah, yeah, some ridiculous speed. It's crazy. Yeah, that's right, it was tested over Western Australia. It went faster than they expected. <laughs> they got better results. They said, wow, this thing goes. <laughs> so all we've got to do is attach a plane to it. Yeah. But that's a few years off. And the other one, of course, is that um, the next area might be to, these are, by the way, that's called suborbital flighting because you don't go so far out that you need all that re-entry stuff. Um, so you, you just sort of get out there and you go high enough so you can get the advantage of being able to fly through thin air, so low resistance. And we'll talk in the next section about drag. So as you go down, your drag comes back in and you have to fly differently. So you've got to have a multi-purpose aircraft to do that. The other one is, of course, the, the Charles, what's his, Bronson, Bronson, not Branson, Branston is uh, from Virgin Airlines is trying to get uh, commercial flights into space. Um, they had that unfortunate accident last year, but uh, the, the, the still on track apparently, and there's still people prepared to pay the money regardless. And if someone offered me a trip to space, I'd go, yeah, sure. It's dangerous. I don't care. <laughs> I'll do it anyway. Uh, all right. So we'll stop there, have a break.